in order to call yourself bourbon. And even in the early days of the resurgence of the the new renaissance, the rise of whiskey, because whiskey was a dead category for, in, to a large degree 30 years ago. Uh, vodka did a number on it. But um, the as whiskey came back into favor and more, more initially, I thought a lot of brands were launching bourbon. They were trying to get in the bourbon game. And then somewhere along the line, brands started saying, we don't need to stick to these rules, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, and part of that is, you know, we're, we're still, we still have this sort of fallout, I guess, from prohibition here in the, in the States, right? Um, Pre-prohibition, there were distilleries all over the country, um, you know, probably making malt whiskey, rye, bourbon for sure. Um, but, you know, as, as prohibition went on and, and, and more and more distilleries closed down, um, there really were just a few left once things got repealed and, you know, really only three or four bigger companies and they'd kind of amassed whatever, you know, whiskey was still around during that time. And, and it was bourbon. And so, you know, corn whiskey was America's whiskey and still is really, you know, bourbon is king. And it just kind of shaped, yeah, you know, not only how we think about whiskey in this country, but how we taste whiskey, what we expect our whiskey to be like. And yeah, you know, we're part of the pioneering craft movement that is saying, you know, there's just so much more you can do with whiskey. There's so many flavors to be expressed with whiskey, um, even just by, you know, a few simple changes. And for us, that is using barley. You know, that's our, that's our source. That is our grain for the whiskey. I mean, up here in the Pacific Northwest, 70% of the country's barley is grown up here. So, I mean, it makes sense for us to use that, right? And yeah, it just brings a whole new flavor expression to the game. What I'm curious, though, for the international market, does having the being a bourbon probably carries a bit more cachet? Would you say? Does I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, in in the in Asian countries and other places where they where they go wild, wild for American bourbon, right. are you finding that they're also embracing? whiskeys that aren't in the bourbon category, but that are American whiskeys? They absolutely are. Yeah, totally. And I think the reason for that is, you know, when you say whiskey in the States to people from the States, you assume you're talking about bourbon. But, you know, the rest of the world over, whiskey is malt whiskey. You know, it's barley whiskey. And so, yeah, when we, you know, we've brought Westward to Europe, we're actually, we've got, you know, distribution in Australia as well. I've been there to help launch it and people just love it and they grab onto the concept immediately because they know malt whiskey and there's plenty of other countries that make malt whiskey as well. So, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's got a, it's got an understanding and it's got a following. People are absolutely ready to accept it for sure. This is making me thirsty. Can we, uh, oh, before we bring on Greg, let's, let's you and I try the, the, the flagship whiskey, right? The Westward American Single Malt Whiskey. I've got some and, right here. And uh, I've got a bottle here. I've already been dipping in. I had a ginger ale. I did a little ginger ale and and this whiskey. And man, let's... tasty. But I'm gonna let's 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 do it neat. And take it away. Yeah. Hey. Cheers to you. Cheers to everybody tuning in. So. It's got a great nose to it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so we want we want Westward to be a single malt that jumps out of the glass, you know, robust, great vanilla, brown sugar, spice from the barrel. Um, we are going into new oak, like you know, all domestic whiskey makers are. Um, but yeah, and then a nice kind of tobacco leather, a little a more of that oak in the finish. Um, but yeah, just a just a big characterful whiskey. It's got to me, it's got a lot of spice on it. Um, I mean, I really refreshing it. It's sort of, uh, at least that first trip down the gullet, I got a little sweetness right up front. And then on the back, man, I got a lot, I got some spice going there. Are you yeah. trying to do that? Were you trying, are you messing with right now, Miles? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, this whole God. time going to be messing. With I'm on to you. I'm on to you. Just wait until Greg on. jumps in too. You're going to be outmatched. Like it, yeah, it's over. Just trying to throw some complexity at me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you know, and on the second sip, that that spice is actually going to back off a bit. 
Um, I mean, part of that is that we do bottle westward at 90, at 45 percent, you know, just slightly higher than, you know, most whiskeys you'd come across. That's again, we do want it to be a bit more robust. Um, also, you know, people do like to add a dash of water or a cube. And we feel like with westward, you know, it's just a, high, a bit of a higher proof. If you want to dose a little water in there, you're not going to, you know, dilute it too much. It's still going to, you know, give full character. So. Yeah, it's it's absolutely delicious. Can you tell us a, a, just a little bit about the the origin of the brand? You said 2004. So yeah. how did it happen? So so Westward is born out of the love of barley. And, you know, we come from um, Portland, where we have a massive brewing culture here. You know, we've got a, something around 80 or I mean, the last time I counted, I think there were 84 breweries in the metro area. And so we were actually started by ex-brewers. Um, you know, this, this is a whiskey that has its roots in beer. I'm also an ex-brewer myself. I, I brewed in, in Portland for about five years before I was hired on at uh, Westward to make whiskey there. So, you know, we are all about the barley. Like I said, we're very selective about what we get in. You know, we're very hands-on with our maltster, maybe even to an annoying level, probably from their point of view, I'm sure. Um, you know, we, modif we want to modify it a certain way. Um, and then, yeah, we're using an ale yeast to ferment our wash. You know, that's not something you typically find with American whiskey makers. We are using what beer makers call the Chico yeast. It's the American, it's the Sierra Nevada pale ale yeast strain. You know, ubiquitous crafts pale ale strain. So we use that to ferment the, the wash and get these big tropical fruits and floral notes coming out of that fermentation. Well, how, so, how big of a factor is that miles the the yeast because i think when when most people the lay person thinks of the process and what they know of the process of making whiskey you don't think very often about the the yeast which is the engine without the yeast there is no there is no alcohol right but but i my impression is that a lot of people simply think of the yeast as the means to an end to convert that starch to sugar but it also plays a role in the flavor as well, right? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Yeah, and thank you for hitting on that because it is. You know, yeah, I, I think it can be viewed um, generally as, right, exactly. You know, it creates alcohol, right? But it does so many other things. I mean, it's just a, it's a biochemistry, you know, cornucopia of what's going on in there, really. And a lot of flavor is developed there. You know, a lot of what we, you know, call esters, organic acids, that's, a lot of the fruit and floral and, you know, kind of chocolatey notes that we can get from whiskey that comes from fermentation. And so it, you know, really adds a lot to the character of the spirit. Um, what you choose to do with that then afterwards also affects really just how much flavor from fermentation you're going to get. Because if you're putting that really flavorful wash into a still and you're distilling it with a lot of reflux and you're actually really, you know, cleaning that spirit up, you're stripping a lot of that character out. And so there's kind of two factors there. Yeah, yeast is absolutely super, super crucial to creating a lot of great flavor, but it can also be stripped out if you're not careful when you're distilling. Uh, Rick Rishall has written in and asked, what about the uh, water? What's your water source? You have a special water source? Oh, great question. Yeah, so, so in Portland, we are in the Willamette Valley. So we're between two mountain ranges, east and west. We have, you know, coastal range and then the Cascade Range uh, to the east of us, uh, just outside the city. And that's actually where our water comes from. They're called the Cascades because we have the Columbia River Gorge right there, just this huge stretch where the Columbia River goes down and just waterfalls everywhere. It's just mind-bogglingly beautiful. And the water is is coming down from that mountain. So it's snow melt, it's rainfall coming from the Cascades down to Portland that we use. So it's super soft, it's really clean, it's great for making whiskey. Yeah, great question. Well, we got one from Jim Whiskey. <laughs> At least that's the name we're using. Is that his last name? I think he's related to Bob Lush. Have you ever met Bob Lush, that guy? Yeah, he's terrible. You know, uh, Jim Whiskey wants to know, uh, cola or ginger ale, if you're gonna mix it. Well, Jim, as I mentioned, I have mixed it with the ginger ale, I'll even give a little plug here for our friends at Fever Tree. Uh, and I only do that because it brings up a point in terms of mixers. I mean, Jim, you do what you want. You want cola, you want ginger ale, you do that. But here's a, a key thing, and, I, and I, I, Miles, I think, will agree with me here. If you are going to mix anything with your 
with your whiskey, make sure you're using good mixers. Because se- if you're going to do this, 70% of this drink is the mixer. And then the way, you know, obviously the spirit is the base. It's the thing that drives the drink, but you can have the bet. You can have Westward. You can have great whiskey. You put a shitty mixer in there. We're done. Buy, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like buying a sports car and putting crummy oil in it or buying a super nice guitar and putting crap strings on it. You know, it's, it's. It's a factor for sure. And yeah, ginger, ginger ale is great with Westwood, especially because of that spice. It's a great flavor match. Yeah. They, it, they really I'm telling well. you, like I, I, I'm a big bourbon and ginger drinker and I have certain brands that I go to with, with my bourbon and gingers. And I thought, you know, I want to, this is kind of my go-to drink. And I went, you know, let me try it with this. And man, it is, it, it's just got that exactly what you said. I think it's the, there was a already I mentioned the you know that sort of vibrancy that I got when I first tried the whiskey. So now you put a little bubbly ginger ale in there as well, and it's a party in your mouth. That's all yeah, it is. Well, it's a big yeah, party. Um, I we, I'm thinking that maybe th- we should bring on. Did we did we lose him? I don't even. Where 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 is Greg McClellan? Greg, are you around? Greg gone. I think I'm here. He's here. Great. You can't see your video. I can't see you. Can you see, Greg? Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, I apologize. I'm here. Let's see. Uh, let me ask. Uh, let me ask Thad. Oh, Thad, what? is Greg? Oh, there he is. There he is. He must have clicked on it. Yeah. Hi. How are you, man? Greg's back. Um, let me hear you talk now for a second. How are you guys doing? Okay. Now we're everything's everything's safe. By the way, folks, it's COVID. What do you want? We're trying. Yeah. Stuff to go. <laughs> uh, Greg, uh, you're up. At, you're in the you're in McMinnville, which is one of the coolest areas. Anybody that loves wine, you have to make a pilgrimage to that area. It's it's Dundee, McMinnville, right there in the Willamette Valley. You're probably about what 45 minutes to an hour south of Portland, right? Yeah, we're an hour south southwest of Portland. And as I was telling you earlier today, we literally brought in the last five tons of Pinot Noir. So I get to celebrate with you guys. We're done with harvest as of half an hour ago. Wow. No better way to celebrate. Amazing. Ching. Cheers, Cheers man. You. Congratulations. Thank you. That is, that is a, I mean, and, you know, we're doing this, but that's a huge moment. I, I know I have a lot of winemaker friends, and everything you've done from the moment last harvest ended comes down to this when you're picking those grapes and it's it's got to be such an amazing feeling i you know and it it's great that he could join us you know to actually find a few minutes during you know harvest and crush here where yeah i mean it's just an absolutely insane time for winemakers it's it's like the one time a year they work right is that you know it's it's so crazy that greg forgot forgot to pay his internet bill clearly because we keep losing him um (laughs) <laughs> that's how crazy it is these winemakers are like man we're doing the grapes we're doing this and then they're like there's no internet so miles i think we've lost greg uh well, Thad just back but um yeah man, we- i guess maybe he doesn't like us i don't know maybe there's something going on here well let, this is a good time to remind everybody that we do have a contest tonight we're giving away a flavia membership and a goodie bag a goodie bag from westward which is really fabulous again you got the you got the uh, the Flaviar's Pinot Noir cask finish, the Westward American single malt, and glassware, and a waterproof wool cap, which everybody there's all the rage up there in Portland. Um, and uh, so the question that we're doing here is your top three secret shame songs, songs that when you hear them, you roll up your windows in the car, you feel a little bit ashamed. But you sing that song. You sing that song at the top of your lungs. The top three. Put them in there. We're going to get to those at the end of the show. Miles and I, maybe Greg. Maybe Greg's had enough of us, but um, maybe he I just guess. He fell asleep, you know? It's been a long day. Because I don't know if everybody knows that Greg was out picking all the grapes himself. So That's he does. Right. And he has to run them in. Got the backpack. Runs them in. Dumps them. Man, it, it's a, it's a, oh, here he comes. Sorry, guys. It's all right. He's back. We're in the middle of nowhere. Sometimes 
we lose uh, connection. Apologies. We just blamed it on you were so busy with winemaking, you forgot to pay your internet bill. Yeah, yeah no. still, still sipping. There we go. Let's let's quickly have a drink with Greg before we lose him again. There we go. Uh, you know what we should do? <laughs> let's jump into this. Let's jump into this right now, so yeah. you can tell us. Oh, he's frozen again. God damn it! <laughs> hey. All right, we're getting there. Miles and I. Good thing is we have somebody here that knows a little bit of something, something about this whiskey. So, Miles, tell us what we got here. Let's talk about and- it. Oh, we got some science coming in. Nice. Great. Excellent. Um, yeah, so so what we have here is our Westward Pinot Cask finish. Uh, and this whiskey was actually finished in Greg's barrels, in some of Greg's barrels from his Suzor wines. And this one in particular that we're sipping on tonight, um, I worked with Flaviar. So this is actually made exclusively for Flaviar and is available only through Flaviar. Hear that? I mean, hear this, that? Yeah, this is the first. This is the first Pinot finish to leave Oregon, and it's going straight to to Flaviar. is a blend I created with. Flaviar. Why? Why though, Miles? Let me ask you, right up front. Where's the? What's the kernel of the idea? Is I mean, it, pe- uh, finishing whiskey in in wine barrels is not anything new. But did you knew you needed to do it uh, with? And and Pinot Noir isn't one that I have seen a lot though. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's, there, I mean, there's good reason for it, uh, for us doing it. You know, we are a single malt maker, but we're making American single malt and we're making a single malt that we, you know, say speaks of its origins, right? And so, yeah, typically you see sherry finish, you know, a port finish. Um, but for us, that just didn't really ring true with our story at Westward, right? You know, where we're using Pacific Northwest ingredients. Uh, this is where we're from. And, you know, so to, to explore, you know, a wine finish on our malt, uh, we, turn to, we turn to the valley. You know, we've got world-class winemakers like Greg just down the road. Should we acknowledge that Greg's here? Because I feel like he's, Back. he's kind of dissing us, man. He keeps, he keeps leaving, just jumping out. Hey, you I'm know. sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, very, very quickly say something about what you've done here, because I feel like we, we have a limited time with you tonight. Let's yeah, see. Right. Well, I can truly say one fascinating thing. So barrels is really my only uh, contribution to what you guys are about to drink soon. And when you pick up a brand new barrel from France, which I buy every year, they're $1,000 a piece. They're ridiculously expensive. It's oak grown in France. Let's say the barrel weighs 100, 110 pounds. When I gave those barrels to Miles and Westward, they probably weighed 10 pounds more. They were totally dry. What was in them was basically five years of wine, dried out, but it's that tannin, it's that fruit, it's that acid, it's all of those components of wine concentrated deep into those wood staves. And it's insane because that that uh, whiskey pulls all of that out of that barrel, and that's what you get. That's so, what it becomes. Right. So as, as someone with a seasoned palate, obviously for wine, and do you pick it up right away when you try the whiskey? Are you able to identify the components from your barrels? I mean, I've got them both here. The first thing that I notice, I, I could not say, well, that's my barrel. But I can definitely. I'm saying what you, the difference between the, the 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 flagship one and then the Pinot Noir cast finish one. Are you are you able to perceive that and go, oh yeah, there's you mentioned there's the tannins that there's this. Are you able to get that right away? Uh, without bullshitting, I think so. You know, okay. and it, it definitely has a broader, riper, just pure fruit component to it. But it, to me, more than anything else, it's just interesting how different. Um, the same whiskey can be with a different barrel. Like that barrel can make such a huge difference as well. And it's cool to see an Oregon product going into you know a barrel that was used for another Oregon product. Yeah, and, and Miles, why why did you choose Suzor? I mean, obviously great wine, but was there an existing relationship, or did you just? Yeah. Well, so and I, Greg, thank you for the. 
for the truth on that. You know, I, I love that. This is, and that's what I was going for. I, you know, this is a Pinot Noir finish. This isn't a Pinot Noir flavored version of Westward. And I think Greg absolutely nailed it there. You, you do experience different things. And what I was aiming for with the Pinot Noir finish was amplifying some other aspects of Westward that are otherwise kind of toned down you know, in a regular blend. And so, yeah, I thought, you know, Pinot Noir will absolutely turn up those, you know, fruit notes that you find in the whiskey for sure without really just having Pinot Noir kind of step all over the whiskey itself. So, you know, you retain the core characteristics of the whiskey. Uh, you just turn up those fruit aspects. You turn up some of the herbaceousness, you know, from that interaction with the French oak itself. Um, but yeah, yeah, we did, uh, we did have a relationship with, with Greg before, you know, striking out on our, our Pinot Noir cask adventure. Um, he and our founder, Christian Krogstad, know each other um going going back i'll actually greg's still with us so if you want to tell the story greg um while well, you're here miles is probably too embarrassed but miles and i actually met at the uh the mustache competition of 08 in portland and he won obviously but i came third place um but no but christian the founder of westward he and i uh worked together at another winery and then when he started the distillery i lived like five blocks away and i was a 22 year old scumbag and he said you want to come down help bottle some of the product and i was more than happy to and that slowly you know westward whiskey started to build and build and build and i was able to build suzor uh over the next few years and you know with good friends you keep in touch you always talk to each other and then eventually the businesses kind of get to marry as well is there is there a lot of synergy going on between the wine and whiskey world up there? Or are you guys trailblazers? I would say Westward Whiskey is a trailblazer in this, but that's my take on it. Yeah, I mean this is this is the this is the first of of the the collaboration in this way that I know of. Yeah, and that's you know that's such a cool thing to have this long history, you know, with Greg and with other winemakers. You know, that really shines a light on the collaborative spirit that we have here in Oregon um, and, you know, that you find throughout craft, you know, wine and spirits and beer. We're all, you know, we're a bunch of makers that are really just curious about what each other is doing. You know, we appreciate what other makers are up to. And yeah, I mean, when I, we get the chance to actually collaborate on something, it's it's spectacular. Now, one of the one of the things that jumps out at me, the difference between, between the, the single, the American single malt and the Pinot Noir cast finish is I got a, a smokiness kind of a cigar box, uh, flavor to there. Are you guys getting that at all? I mean, that's one of the notes that I was not in the first whiskey that I'm definitely getting here. Yeah. I, you know, I get a little more tobacco off the Pinot finish, some fresh cut hay. Um, which I, yeah, I mean, you could definitely, you know, lead into like cedar for sure. Yeah, there, exactly. There's a woodiness to it, you know, mm -hmm. that I, that, and, and also kind of this, um, on the nose, I, I had this, it reminded me of a forest in the morning when you've got the dew and all that. It was, it was very fresh, green even more so than on the, the initial one had that too. And, and, and I think maybe part of that is, you know, the way that we experience anything, whether it's a spirit, whether it's food is knowing where it comes from informs how you experience it. Right. Cause oh, I'm, I'm thinking of the Pacific Northwest as I'm drinking this and it, and it's conjuring images of uh, conjuring experiences that I've had up there especially in nature would you say that's accurate that you bring a lot of that to the table when you're when you're tasting something i think so i mean it's i think you're hitting it on the head i mean it's that oak barrel again it informs you so much about the product it's you know, if the whiskey is the body then the barrel whatever you're housing it in that's the outfit you know, and that can change uh, a whiskey this way, that way. It can change a wine this way or that way. And so if you're using something elegant, it's going to match with that whiskey and, and bring it that direction. So I think you got it. 
But how much do you think, too, Greg, like, sorry, Miles, I mean to cut you off, but Greg, how much do you think the way that people uh, remember wines and spirits are impacted by where they were? I'm especially thinking this more with wine, because when I wrote my book, American Wino, I drove all over the country, obviously, and I tried so many wines in so many different places, and and I found that later, when the winemakers would send me those wines, it was a way different experience, like trying Virginia wines or or the uh, wines from the Finger Lakes in New York. I mean, look, we know what we're going to get where you're from. We know what we're going to get in California. I mean, these are world-class wines. But when I was in these other places, I remember thinking, my God. God, like it was so good. It was, but how much of that is where you are, who you're with, the friends you're with, you know, maybe some of the best bottles of wine you ever had were at a concert that blew your mind and you're with somebody you're in love with. And right. I mean, and I think probably the same thing with whiskey as well. Right, Miles? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, it, it should be evocative, right? That's, you know, and, and what I love about the, the Pinot Noir finish and about this blend, especially, um, I mean, yeah, Greg's wine are they're they're incredible. Um, I they're just absolutely stunning. And you do. I mean, I've I've been to his his studio. I've been to the 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 vineyard, and I mean, yeah, they're just so evocative of that place. And I think anything you know that you're crafting, be it a wine or a spirit like whiskey, uh, it should be evocative. If you, if you're doing your job right, um, yeah, it absolutely should you know take you to that place. Um, what's cool about using Greg's barrels is, I mean, he's a spectacular winemaker and he makes delicious wine. And then, you know, we're also using new, you know, new wood for our whiskey. You know, we're going into white American oak charred barrels, you know, your, your standard American barrel. So you're getting, you know, this big vanilla and spice note, but then, you know, you get to these, you know, European oak, you know, French grown you know, barrels that are, you know, hand split staves that are, you know, aged for years outside that are just really herbaceous and have so much else going on that, um, yeah, the whiskey's just going to go on a whole other adventure and just add, you know, a touch of elegance to it, really. I'm curious, what happens to the barrels? So now they've been used for wine, now they've been used for you. What happens when you're done with them, Miles? Where do they go? Uh, well, we actually just opened a pop-up in Northwest Portland, a pop-up store. A tasting room so they're actually in a big old pyramid right there for now um but honestly you know we're such a small operation we haven't even really had to think about what we're going to do with our spent wine barrels um but uh what could i mean could I, I guess what i was wondering was could another spirit age could you know because look bourbon barrels go all over the place right you know there there could another spirit I wonder what that would do to a spirit if you were to age it in in something that that once housed amazing Pinot Noir, then housed amazing whiskey. I'd be interested to see what that might do to a rum or what that might, you know. No kidding. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, we we trade barrels with brewers as well. And, you know, we've even picked up barrels that, uh, you know, have held um, some tequila and have held, you know, some port. So, yeah, I mean, I you know, who's to say, I, I think eventually at some point you get to some sort of, you know, diminishing returns there where there's just so much going on with the barrel, but, um, honestly, who knows, but you know, that's part of experimenting with, with new flavors. And Greg, I got to ask you about uh, Suzer because again, I, I brought up what a just phenomenal, I, I would argue, I would argue that you know, the Willamette Valley makes the best Pinot Noir in the United States for my palate. Okay. And there are so many incredible winemakers there that are doing such great things in such a really compact area as well. Um, where do you, where would you say that Suzar is, first of all, price point wise, you know, where are you guys at price point wise? Where are you uh, size wise compared to some of the other ones up there in the area? Because let's face it, some of the big boys have come in and bought up, right? That's happened there uh, in in Willamette, Uh, you know, the gallows of the world and some others have come in and, and, and I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying you can knock that. We'll knock that later off the air, but where do you, where do you, where does Suzar for people that don't are not familiar with the brand, with the label, where do you fit in that world? 
price wise, size wise, taste wise? Yeah, well, I think price wise, I mean, we are between, you know, 28 and $40. My wife, who is the other half of Suzor, always said, I don't want to make wine that I can't afford to drink. And so it became that simple make wine that we can afford to drink ourselves. And for production, we brought in everything so far this year, and we're going to be, you know, we do Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Rose, Gamay Noir, and I think we're doing about 700 cases. Uh, everything. In, I mean, everything. So to put that next to, you know, a, a generic winery in California, they're probably, you know, what What is the biggest wine? What's California. the biggest winery in, what's the biggest winery in Oregon? King, King Estate, would it be? Or, or A to Z. And, uh, we are a blip on their radar, but you know, again, it's, it's my wife and I, which is amazing. It's kind of like Westward where you just, we do all the work. We know what we're doing. It's me cleaning the barrels, me doing the pick dates, my wife and I sorting the fruit. It's intimate, sometimes for better or worse, because it is a family affair, but it's small. And I think that's what most of Oregon really does well. Those small produce. I mean, and and if, if for no other reason, so McMinnville's right next to a place called Dundee, and I have been to Dundee, and I have to tell you, there is a bar there. Is it Lumpy's? Yeah, Lumpy. Called Lumpy's. Now, when I first went to Lumpy's, I was like, man, this is what a this is one of the shittiest dive bars I've ever been in my life. Right when I walked in, but they had a surprise for me. Lumpy's had a surprise for me when I was in there. I went in and, and by the way, when I say shitty, it's dive bars. I say that affectionately. I love shitty dive bars. I grew up in poor in Philadelphia, but, uh, I was in there and you know, it's like the wood panel walls and we're playing pool and they had a big sign on the wall that said Lumpy's the world's most bodacious bar. It's quite a claim. I think we can, we can all agree guys. That's quite a claim. And I wasn't buying it until I went up to the bar and the bartender said, are you interested in a pudding shot? I said, a pudding shot? Yes. We have figured out a way to put vodka in pudding and keep the, keep the structural integrity of the pudding intact with the vodka in there. And this is about six years ago, $3 a shot. So I ordered a round of pudding shots for my group. Everybody loved it. And I thought, at that moment, Lumpy's took bodaciousness to a level I'd not seen before. That's all I'm going to say. So even if you don't like the wine, and even if you don't want to go up to Westward, even if you want to go there, go for the Lumpy's, and then maybe the wine and the, and the whiskey will hook you, right? That's all I'm saying. Could you know, be a way I'm, to do it. I'm so glad that we're talking about pudding shots right now. It's one of my favorite guilty pleasures. And it's kind of the theme of, our, of the show here, right? Guilty pleasures with the songs. <laughs> Um, I absolutely love putting shots to the point where my neighborhood bar, I live in North Portland, um, s has served them forever. And a friend of mine just about two years ago opened this really nice kind of tiki decked out cocktail bar here in Portland called Hey Love. And I made her promise to put a pudding shot on for me. So there is a rotating pudding shot in this incredibly nice cocktail bar. It's just warms my heart. It's amazing. As I'm. As I'm talking to you, Miles, I'm now regretting that I wore this T-shirt because the T-shirt I should have wore, worn, one of my prized possessions. I collect bar wear. I collect T-shirts and hats, but really collect them, right? I have rules. You cannot order that shit online. It's not fair. You have to have gone there, okay? Right. I have a great T-shirt from one of the great, uh, what's called adult bars? Uh, Mary's. Yes. Mary's is a strip club in Portland where they have to put the music on the jukebox, right? The dancers go to the jukebox and put their music in there. Yeah, they've got a handful of quarters. They play the jukebox themselves. That is our oldest uh, dancing club. It is all women owned here in Portland, Oregon. It's, it's, it's so good. It's, I mean, and it's a, it's a, you know, just a, Portland's a great town. I really do love it up there. I need to get back up. I, I would have been up for Portland Cocktail Week, but we know what happened there. Uh, yes. Speaking of visiting Portland, we do have a question here from Ari Stillman. Miles, I'll be visiting Portland for the first time tomorrow from Los Angeles. Any chance you could oversee a tasting in person? 
let me handle this one for you, Miles. All right, you're, you, you said you're coming from Los Angeles. Huge no-no up in Oregon. Don't tell them. I can't tell them you're from, right? Isn't that the big knock? Is it? Because I got pulled over as soon as I crossed the, as soon as I crossed into Oregon, I got pulled over. No joke. Yeah. Driving it, I was like, what the hell? Because I had the California plates. No way. So let's say, let's say Ari's coming from somewhere else. No, I don't know. Are you doing tastings right now? You guys doing them because of COVID? Yeah. So I'm glad that came up. Also, we we do have a tasting room at the distillery. Um, if you if you search for the distillery, uh, you will find it. Uh, the tasting room. Let's see, what's today? Friday. Today's Thursday. Uh, okay, I'm a little ahead of myself. Yeah. So the tasting room will be open tomorrow from I think noon to seven or eight. I'll actually be at our barrel house. That's where I'm at now. Um, just about ten miles south of Oregon. So unfortunately, Ari, I can't lead you through a tasting, but we will be open and we are doing tastings, and you can actually grab. Uh, a lot of fun one-offs and specialty bottles at the tasting room. So yeah, cruise on in. Could you leave? Could you leave word that Ari's coming in and to pour him a little bit of extra in his tasting? There you go. Absolutely, hundred percent. There you go, Ari. He's gonna you know you're you're he's gonna go in and go. Miles said this, and you're like, what? No, he didn't. Uh, Greg, can people come? Can people come taste Suzor too? Yeah, I mean, as I said, we're so small, we don't have a tasting room, but I think people just call us through the website and we always host tastings at the winery. Um, we're always here, especially right now. I tasted people on our Chardonnay that was halfway fermenting the other day. And it's, it's super fun because we get to show people what the hell we're doing over here. Sure. I want to taste some, I want to taste some wines, man. Come well, on. A year when you can come up and visit, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. I'll do it. I'll do it. I was going to say, so, I don't, Greg, I don't think I've seen you since March when we did our last uh, hangout. So. It was uh, right when COVID was starting to be a threat. How it's going? <laughs> My God! Now I need now I need more whiskey. After that, here's to the so, end of this thing. Someday, someday. Um, so, guys, I want to remind everybody out there: get your you have one minute to get your contest entries in your top three secret shame songs. I gotta ask Miles, what are yours, man? Oh. Uh, I didn't realize you were going to ask us. Okay. Wow. So How embarrassing. Envision, envision the scene from Tommy Boy, Chris <laughs> Farley, David Spade, and it was that Carpenters. Don't you remember you told me you loved me, baby? That's what I'm talking about. What's Great. that song where you're in the car and that one comes on and you. All right, man. You know, full on, yeah, total honesty, Neil Diamond, Cherry Cherry. It's, but that I don't know if that's a shame song. Really? I'm embarrassed. She got the way to move me, Jerry. Come on, man. That's a bump, 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 bump. Everybody's like, stop. Please stop. You know, see, right. I'm, I'm a metal guy. So, yeah, it is, that's, that's embarrassing. To, to you, that would be, all right, I got it. Okay, Greg, what do you got? <laughs> I'm going to reveal something bad. Kelly Clarkson, Since You've Been Gone. Wow. <sighs> I might, I might, I might be there too. It's, it's the most singable song. I used to have that. Was it? Hey, now you're an all star. <laughs> but then I, yeah, that one fell out of favor for me. But uh, yeah, that was one of the ones too. Um, it's a. Oh, we got. Hold on, we got somebody. Oh, we got another comment coming in here. Uh, Moitz Moitza says I'm loving the shape of the bottle and label. What's up with the arrow, though? The arrow. The arrow points west. We are westward. We are, you know, we are the, the pioneering American single malts. We, we have that um, craft pioneering spirit within us. So, yeah, the arrow points west, you know? Go west and grow up with the country, young man, or whatever he said. That's right. Was that Horatio Alger? That's what I was thinking. No. Or Emerson? No, wait, wasn't Go West, young man? Somebody figure that out for us. I thought, that we... was Emerson, uh, I thought that was Emerson, but could have definitely been Horatio Alger. Could have been. I say we get to the, uh, I say we, I, we got a lot of people trying to win these uh, prizes here. So the first thing we want to say is, what do you want to give away first? Do you want to give away the Flaviar membership, or do you want to give away the goodie, goodie bag from Westward? Let's go goodie bag, yeah. Let's go goodie bag, all right. It's somebody that Greg, 
I'm gonna I'm guys, I'm gonna just throw out some of these entries and we'll just we'll just pick who we like. Here we go. If anybody right. knows wishful thinking by go west, they win right away. They win right away. All right. I re I re light Taylor Swift's shake it off. Megan Trainer's all about the base. Oh man, I do like that one. Uh Mr. Jones by Counting Crows. All right, this brings up an interesting question. Is Counting Crows a shame song? I, I would say so. Yeah. yeah. I'm voting. Okay. All right. Okay. So that, that's in the running there, uh, Irie Light. Uh, Chris Maxwell, Barbie Girl by Aqua. Copacabana by... No way, man. You can't be ashamed of Barry Manilow. I'm sorry. I'm ruling that one. And Escape the Rupert Home, the Pina Colada song. What? What? Uh, what the hell was it? Go West, Young Man, Go West was an expression first used by John Babson Lane Sewell in the Terra Hotta Express in 1851. Here we learned something. Uh, Brendan Kite, It's Raining Men, Kung Fu Fighting. See, I don't think Kung Fu Fighting is a shame song, though. Like, yeah, I, I think it, I put the windows down when Kung Fu Fighting's yeah. on, and I look out and I go, oh! Is that culturally inappropriate now, that song, by the way? I was curious. Depends it on those, Well, because it, it's Carl Douglas wrote it, and I guess Carl Douglas is African-American, so he could argue that they, you know, there's a whole lot of cultural appropriation going on across the board. But I was wondering about that song because it does go, it's a stupid song, but it has the, -in 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 -in. is that wrong now? Can you, no? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether we disqualify it for this reason. That's all. Ah. Uh, sunshine on my shoulder. That's nothing to be ashamed of. There's no shame in that game. All right, we can't do Rick Astley. Two, two on the nose. Uh, ooh, Rick Rishaw said, I think we're alone now by Debbie Gibson. Do you believe in love by Huey Lewis in the news? And Rocky Mountain High by John Denver. That's pretty good. Nice. Yeah. That's, that's all three from one. That's that's one person. Rick Rishaw. OB Badad says, Baby Shark. <laughs> it's my party by Leslie. Do but American Pie by Don McLean. I, I again, I don't think. Are you ashamed of that? No, right? You'd <laughs> sing that. My, you're a heavy metal guy. You'd you you've been drunk singing that with your friends, haven't you? No, I, I abhor that song. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be interesting. How we were. Well, by the way, Miles, since we're giving away the Westward one here, you're gonna have the the final say on this one for sure. Oh, fantastic. Um, let's see. Uh, Christopher Blade, Tiffany's I Think We're Alone Now. Ooh, Spandau Ballet's True. That is a good one. You know that one? Uh, ha, 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 ha. I'll stop singing now. Uh, and Simple Minds, Don't You Forget About Me? Again, like, am I? Ah, that's a banger. That's a, that's a real song. That's a legit song. You can't be no nothing. <laughs> Rachel Eisenstadt Sankey says Toxic by Britney Spears. Barbie Girl by Aqua and Inside Out by Eve Six. That's a good one. That's a good uh, list right there. We got A to DJ Gaming mm Bop by Hanson. Oof, oof. Go go. Oh, see, That's this tough. is where you go. Miss Independent by Kelly Clarkson. Yes, but then where you lose it is Go Go's. Our lips are sealed. The Go Go's are the Go Go's were like a punk band. You can't be ashamed of the Go Go's, right? No, that's a good song. That's a good band. That is not it. If you're ashamed of the Go-Go's, I'm ashamed of you. Okay? That's all I'm saying. Oh, Jackie Oatley with Waterfalls by TLC. <laughs> that is a good one. You know, Miles is like, what's that one? You know the song? I love that song. I, I have go, Jackie, and she burned, time. and one eye burned Andre Risen's house down. She should get sure props just for that. Yeah, all right. Uh, what else is in there? We got uh, Mbop by Hanson, TLC's Waterfalls, and Every Rose Has Its Thorn by Poison. I will admit I know how to play that song on guitar. I think Jackie Oakley just jumped into the lead, right? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead. There's a bunch here. Uh, Karen R. White says, Roll Me Away by Bob Seger. Through the Eyes of Love by Melissa Manchester. And Abracadabra by Steve Miller. Ooh. 
good one. That's it, Steve it, Miller. Is, we, I think we can all agree that's the shittiest song, the shittiest hit in the Steve Miller uh, canon. Wouldn't we agree? Yeah, yeah, I think he yeah. uh, zigged when he should have zagged there. <laughs> yeah, by the way, quick aside here. Many, many years ago, I went to the Bob Bondurant School of Racing in Arizona, in Phoenix, Arizona. I was learned how to race NASCAR. It's me and a small group of people. We're getting our, we're gearing up. We're putting our suits on. We're talking, talking to this guy. And I said, hey, his name's Steve. I think you know where this story's going. And he's like, you know, we're talking. And he's like, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm a newspaper columnist here. And I said, what do you do, Steve? And he says, I'm in a band. I said, oh, yeah, you guys play around here, Phoenix? He's like, yeah, Phoenix, we play around like all over the place. It's like, oh, really? And he's like, I said, yeah, what's the name of the band? He's like, Steve Miller Band. And I was like, you're Steve Miller? Because <laughs> Steve Miller does not look like a rock star. But you don't see Steve Miller and go, that guy's a red. But it was Steve Miller. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Dropping a name. But yeah, it was kind of funny. I'm like, do you guys play around Phoenix? He's like, yeah, we play Phoenix all over the place. What's the band? Steve Miller band. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, where were we? Here and there. Play uh, no, come on, Candle Power. Relax by Frankie Goes to Hollywood. That's a good song. All She Wants to Do is Dance by Don Henley and Major Tom by Peter Schilling. I would, I would play all of those songs in the middle of my street right now naked singing those. Sorry. Chumbawamba's Tub Thumping? How do we come down on that one, guys? I get knocked down, but I get up again. Yeah, I hate I it. I would love to see Miles singing that song in his car. Um, we'll, we'll do karaoke sometime. This is Nathan McNeil's entry. Tub thumping, Semisonic's closing time, and getting jiggy with it by Will Smith. Oof. It's pretty good. It's pretty yeah. good. Um, all right, a couple more. Let me jump up. Man, why the... YMCA by the Village People? No, there's no shame there. Just a Gigolo by David Lee Roth? How dare you make fun of David Lee Roth when Eddie Van, Eddie Van Halen just died? Too soon. So too soon. Too soon. Yeah, let's let's all raise one to Eddie Van Halen. By the way, here's to him. Miles, how did you feel about uh, Stephen Stills? Twitter, kind of dissed Eddie Van Halen. Did you see this? I didn't. No. What, what's all Somebody, that? About? He re he reposted an article about or somebody asked him how he felt about Eddie Van Halen, and he wrote "meh, not my thing." And then everybody, of course, went after him. Like, wow. How dare you? This is like the day after he died. Were wow. you an Eddie Van Halen? Were you a fan of Eddie Van Halen? Yes. Well, you know, and I mean, Stephen Stills, I guess you know he's he's pretty much been acoustic his whole career, right? So I, I mean, sure. never the two shall meet, I guess, but. No, I mean, I, you know, I, my dad was a um, concert producer and rock producer in the 80s. I grew up around them. I actually got piggyback rides from Eddie Van Halen. Swell guy. Love him. I thought he was awesome. I miss him. Yeah, absolutely. But I guess I'm partial. Wow. Man, that's awesome. Piggyback ride from Eddie Van Halen. That's amazing. You should make a t-shirt. I got a piggyback ride or yeah. yeah. Um, by the way, can we also do the worst entries here? Uh, Rob Gleason, freedom by George Michael. That's a bad song. Come on in the air tonight by Phil Collins. What? And this one, come on. I want to strangle Rob Gleason right now. Purple rain. Are you out of your effing mind? Purple rain. Is anybody anybody that's ashamed of Purple Rain? I mean, needs bad to move. Great song. stop listening. Stop listening to yeah the, the song though. Come on, Rob Gleason, what are you doing over there? Seth Kramer, hungry like the wolf. Ooh, voices carry by till Tuesday though. That's one that I have. Amy Mann. Now Amy Mann has since you know an oh an Africa by Toto, also good. Oh, that'll get me on the microphone. For sure. That'll do it. Uh, all right. David Galbus Rig. I wear my sunglasses at night by Corey Hart. Walk like an Egyptian by the Bangles. But again, David, you had it. You had us. I think we were all kind of there. And then you went Roxanne by Sting. But where do we begin? 
Do we begin with the fact that it's not by Sting, but it's by the police? <laughs> Thank you. The first, first single by the police is Roxanne, and anybody ashamed of Roxanne has clearly not gone to the red light district and, and seen her. Uh, anybody else? Anybody else? All right, so let's pick one here, guys. Who did we say we liked? I've already forgotten. Was it Jackie? Was it? Do you remember? Yeah. Miles? The- uh every rose has its thorn i feel like that was a good set that was jackie oakley went waterfalls by tlc mbop by hansen and every rose has its thorn yeah mbop is embarrassing that's good that's an eclectic set i like it can we agree that that would be the winner of the westward goodie bag yeah 100 jackie oakley jackie oakley come on Nice Come on down. Get your prize. Jackie, they'll reach out to you on the message there. Congratulations. And now we have to pick the winner. Somebody's going to become a Flaviar member right now. And let me just make sure I didn't miss any good ones. Man, I am. There's some that boggle my mind. I feel, like I, saw, I feel like I saw Greg's face light up when Huey Lewis and the news were mentioned. Is that? Oh, no, he's, he's amazing. There's oh. nothing embarrassing about Huey Lewis. Yeah, He's- this is what I'm saying. I'm more fascinated by the things that people think are embarrassing. Michael D. Dixon says, I ran by Flock of Seagulls. That's a great song. Uh, so- Tainted Love by Soft Cell and Cuts Like a Knife by Brian Adams. Michael D. Dixon, it cuts like a knife and it feels so right. Na 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 na. Miles is ready to. He's. Oh, I was having. He's ready to get. It. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, not feeling good. <laughs> gotta go. Oh. You guys are breaking um, up there. I gotta. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Dustin the Warren Warren Dustin the Wind by Kansas. Are you out of your mind? Oh. I can, bicycle race by Queen. I can't take this. All right. Oh, I can't. Oh, oh. Shots fired. I feel like maybe we got to go with. Oh, oh, my way by Frank. I will smack you. Okay. (laughs) Uh, It's stone me. Van Morrison. Anybody puts Van Morrison on a shamed list. Jeff Banasek. Comfortably numb by Pink Floyd. Oof. I think they're less straight right now. They're not going in the right direction. It's so bad. What, what, what was what were the, what was the one you perked up on? There was there, there was a set with Debbie Gibson that was there were the, the three were just like wow, which were those three? Let's yeah, Debbie Gibson is kind of embarrassing. Um, can Keith, can you find that for me? Whatever the Debbie Gibson, and there was another one that you uh, that you wanted. Well, mi- ooh. I gotta say though, I relight. light. Let's go back and revisit. Shake it off by Taylor Swift. All about that bass. <laughs> Come on. And then Counting Crows, Mr. Jones. That's, that's a, a pretty yeah, that's that's a solid a, one, right? Yeah. That's pretty solid. I, I think in the interest of time, I relight. light. Guys, are we in agreement here? For sure. I relight. light. You, you're a Flaviar member. You're one of us now. Raise it. Nicely done. We'll be, over, we'll be over later for the indoctrination ceremony. <laughs> Let's just hope you have a waterproof wool cap. That's all I'm saying. Uh, so, guys, this has been a tremendous amount of fun. I, uh, I want to uh, thank you both, Miles and Greg, for coming on. I encourage everybody to go to Flaviar. You can only get this, you don't know our finish, you can only get this through Flaviar, right? That's true. That is true. You can get the uh, American Single Malt everywhere. Westward is available every state? Not quite every state, um, but we're getting there. Um, yeah. Most major markets, though, for sure. Um, yeah, and I, you, know, you can also get the, the stout cask finish through Flaviar as well. Uh, which is another one of our fantastic winners. If you want to check that out, it's a delicious dram. Dan, thanks for having me on. Dude, loved having you, man. And Greg, where? what about Suzor? How do people uh, find it? How do they get it? Come to our website, suzorwines.com, and uh, 
If you're ever in the Pacific Northwest, come and visit us. Dan, great to meet you. Miles, always good to see you. It's been, a, it's been a lot of fun, guys. And I want to remind everybody, I'm going to be back here this Tuesday night. Uh, I think it's this Tuesday. Yeah, the, the next Tuesday coming up, I'm doing this. Uh, my old, my dear friend, Brad Jaffe. Brad Jaffe's one of the great spirits writers in the world. Brad Jaffe's going to be joining me. I can't remember what the spirit is, but I think it's Bushmills. Keith? Oh, Keith, it, 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 it's Bushmills. And if it's not Bushmills, He's going to correct me in two seconds and tell me. But uh, I think it's Bushmills, and it's this Tuesday, same time, same bat channel. Uh, I Please, guys, stay safe out there. Get out and vote. Do your thing. Buy some whiskey. Get some wine. I'm Dan Dunn. Thanks for spending this hour with us, and uh, I'll see you next time around.